George, it's an honor, brother. The honor is mine, man. It's good to sit down with you. Thank you. Pleasure, man. I have a lot of questions. Let's do it, man. Let's do I, it. I think people have a lot of questions also, so I'll be the voice for them. I'm excited. <laughs> Paul, what would you say to athletes who love to consume eggs in their diet, but they are concerned about the yolk because of the cholesterol? Right. I mean, eggs are a great food for athletes. The protein in the egg white is very bioavailable. It's much more bioavailable protein in eggs than plant foods, for instance. But people do get worried about cholesterol. And I think this is because we have the cholesterol story all wrong. The first thing to know is that when you eat foods that are rich in cholesterol, like an egg yolk, very few people actually see any rise in their serum, their blood cholesterol, when they eat cholesterol. So food cholesterol doesn't raise blood cholesterol in most people. Mm -hmm. If food cholesterol does raise cholesterol, it makes the LDL particles, these low-density lipoprotein particles, it makes them bigger. Uh, we call these more buoyant, fluffy LDL particles, and the bigger LDL particles are associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. So it's important to know that cholesterol in the diet very rarely raises serum cholesterol, which is essentially LDL cholesterol. And when it does, it makes those LDL particles look, uh, in a way, a bigger, more fluffy pattern of those LDL particles that is associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. What are the nutrients you can get from an animal-based diet that you will never get from a vegan diet? For whatever reason, in mainstream society, we've been told that plants are superfoods. But when you think about it, animal foods, especially animal organs, are really the source of the most nutrients, unique nutrients, to your question, and the most bioavailable forms of these nutrients. So just to take the question at first glance, vegan plant-based diet versus an animal-based diet. And to clarify for people, an animal-based diet includes meat and organs. I also think about an animal-based diet as meat, organs, fruit, honey, and raw dairy. But let's just talk about plant foods versus animal foods with animal foods being meat and organs. There are so many nutrients found in animal foods that do not occur in any appreciable quantity or amount in plant foods. And the list is long. Things like creatine, which we know is essential for muscles, fast, explosive movements. Uh, it's a phosphorus, it's a phosphate donor in the ATP cycle. We know that when we take vegetarians, and we give them creatine supplements, they perform better on tasks of memory mm. and recall. They essentially get smarter, suggesting that a plant-based diet is deficient in this nutrient, clearly, that is essential for proper brain function in humans. There's choline, which is another essential nutrient for neurotransmitter uh, production in the human body. Choline is the base of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which runs so many essential functions throughout our brain and nervous systems, both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Then you have, uh, choline also makes every cell in your body has a membrane, which has phosphatidylcholine. So if you wanna make cell membranes, if you wanna make glia, if you wanna make the coating of neurons that goes around the axonal sheath, if you wanna make neurotransmitters, if you want your memory and your brain to function, you need choline, yeah really cannot get anywhere near the amount of choline you need without animal foods. So we have creatine, carnitine, anserine, taurine, vitamin K2, B12. We also have biotin, a B vitamin essential for healthy hair, skin, and nails. And then we have minerals. And when you think about minerals, people get really confused here because there are minerals in plant foods, things like magnesium or selenium or zinc or copper or iron. These occur in plant foods. But what you find if you look closely at this is that those minerals in plant foods, they're sort of bound up, they're shackled, they're kind of chained to the wall in the plant foods. You can't absorb them. So when we try and get minerals like these from plant foods, we don't absorb them in our bodies. They just pass right through us. Mm. So that's yet another thing that is so beneficial for us in animal foods. And then the last thing to think about with animal foods is there is a whole host of nutrients Things like peptides, small fat fragments of proteins, less than 50 amino acids, that are found in animal foods that don't occur at all in plant foods. And these are really valuable for signaling. We're just beginning to understand what these things do in the human body. Things like BPC-157. This is a peptide that many athletes know about that's helpful for growth, uh, recovery. Uh, that is found in stomach and intestines and tripe. And then there's other peptides that are super important for recovery, found in the liver, hepatocyte growth factor. There's peptides 
peptides in the heart that are probably essential for proper blood growth formation, blood vessel formation in the heart. And then one last nutrient that I'll talk about that's essential for energy production is coenzyme Q10. And that one is found most richly in the heart of animals. Good luck getting enough coenzyme Q10 from plants. It just doesn't occur. So there's really, there's no comparison between animal foods and plant foods. Animal foods are the clear superfoods. And the last thing, the point that I love to make at the end of this discussion is that they're really, the reverse isn't true. There really are no nutrients in plant foods that you can't get from animal foods. And we can talk more about this if you want, but plant foods come with they, plant foods carry with them kind of baggage. They have defense chemicals that I think prevent us from digesting them well. So part of the work that I do that I think is important is helping people understand that the way that we've been told to think about plants for so long is probably incomplete. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not the greatest sources of nutrients and they have all of this ability to mess up our digestion, to de decrease our absorption of nutrients, and really to affect our biochemistry negatively. So that's why I think it's so important to focus on the animal foods with our diet. We can have some plant foods, perhaps like fruit, that are less toxic, but eating a lot of vegetables is a very controversial thing that I recommend avoiding. Mm. I'm gonna drop a bomb that will touch a lot of people, <laughs> including myself. I want to have your opinion about coffee. I knew this one was coming. <laughs> I knew this one was coming. I want to know the truth. You drank coffee this morning, didn't you? No, then not this morning, <laughs> not this morning. but I, 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 I do normally. Okay. Yeah. So if we think about plants, I'll back up for a moment to, to frame this conversation. If you think about plants, what is the purpose of a plant? A plant is a life form. All life forms. Want whether survive and pass their genes. Exactly, exactly. And so how do plants do that? They grow roots and they grow stems and bark and or stems and then they grow uh, leaves which collect the sunlight to photosynthesize to make glucose from sunlight. And they put all of that energy into making DNA contained within a seed. And so plants make a seed. So the seed is the plant baby. And the whole goal of a plant's life is to move that seed somewhere else. There's no point in a seed dropping right below the plant because the plant doesn't move anywhere. The plant wants to move, but the plant can't move. So how does the plant move its seeds? Some plants will put seeds on uh, airborne um, apparatuses that will move them through the air. A lot of plants put their seeds within a sweet, colorful fruit mm. so that animals will consume the fruit, but it's the plant's intention that the seeds don't get destroyed and eaten. So a lot of some plants will even encase their seeds in stone uh, protective carapaces, like armor, like stone fruits, cherries, peaches, uh, plums. These fruits are very clearly taking a seed uh, and putting it inside a protective coating. Animals try to eat the fruit and then they poop or they move the seeds somewhere else. Uh -huh. But the plant seed has to be defended. It has to be very highly defended because if plant seeds were like candy for animals, you can imagine how successful plants would be at moving their DNA somewhere else. Not successful, they would all go extinct. Yes. But coffee is clearly, we consider it a coffee bean, but it's a plant seed. It's a coffee yeah. seed, right? So what is coffee? Coffee is a burned, roasted <laughs> plant seed that then you soak in water. So what are the problems with coffee? First of all, when you take a seed, whether it's a grain, a nut, a seed, or a bean, and you store it somewhere, what happens? It gets moldy. This is not something that hunter-gatherers do very often. We don't store seeds. They get moldy. They get full of mold toxins. So mold toxins, mycotoxins, are a whole separate discussion, separate than plant toxins, but most coffee is full of mycotoxins. Because most seeds, these coffee seeds, have been stored improperly, they get moldy, and they have not been processed correctly. So you have a moldy plant seed that you then burn. The burning of the plant seed creates compounds like acrylamide, and there's pretty good evidence to associate acrylamide with increased rates of cancer. And acrylamide happens a lot of times. Acrylamide happens if you roast anything really, but especially grains uh, have acrylamide. So if you take a piece of toast, which isn't something that I would recommend on an animal-based diet, and you get that brown coating on the toast, there's acrylamide in the toast as you brown the toast. If you brown anything, a donut, a bagel, these are all foods that, that are, I don't think are great for humans. Those all contain acrylamide in the baked goods. So coffee has acrylamide in it because of the roasting process. And then if you actually get to the coffee seed, the coffee bean, you see there are defense chemicals. There are plant defense chemicals in that coffee seed. It, it certainly affects my sleep. If I drink a coffee too late during the day, it, it messes me up really bad. I believe the half-life of caffeine is six to seven hours. 
And pharmacologically, we need four and a half half-lives to get a chemical out of our body. Mm -hmm. So even if you drink coffee at eight o'clock in the morning, you've only got two, two and a half half-lives to clear the caffeine. You still have this methyl xanthine, caffeine is a methyl xanthine, you still have this methyl xanthine circulating in your body, affecting receptors in your brain, uh, adenosine receptors in your brain specifically, and that will affect your sleep architecture. I think it's a recurrent problem that it become a, like a cycle because yeah. I drink coffee, then it affects my sleep. I don't sleep well. I wake up the next day. I don't feel on top of my game. Then I drink another coffee to wake me up, which will affect my sleep again. And I, and I repeatedly do the same mistake again, again, and again, right? There are so many people, I think, that get caught in this cycle with caffeine and with other drugs. You know, all kinds of things are like this. Okay, I'm going to drop a second bomb now. <laughs> I want you to talk to us about alcohol. Right, so alcohol is a product of fermentation. Um, there are two types of fermentation. You can make either acetic acid like vinegar or alcohol is another product of fermentation. And the, a, a glass of wine per day, right. is it good for me or not? <laughs> Ultimately, I think it's not good for you and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Right, I'll tell you why. So wine is fermented fruit. It's fermented grapes. Some people might say, oh, Paul, you're a fan of fruit. Why aren't you a fan of wine? So the things to think about with this are the following. When you have grapes and you pick them off the vine, evolutionarily, throughout our history as hunter-gatherers, I think it would have been very rare that we kept the grapes around. Have you ever had grapes that sit on your counter for a few days? No. They get very moldy, George. They get very, very moldy very quickly. So this is another big problem with wine is mold toxins. Mm -hmm. Fruit is not meant to be overripe. You know, humans, I think, throughout our evolution uh, for millions of years have realized this. Like, if there's fruit and it's ripe, I'm going to eat it right now. Right I'm, I'm going to bring it back to the tribe. It's gone within a day. Nobody's storing fruit because it quickly becomes moldy. And that's a real problem for humans. We don't want moldy fruit. So dried fruit is a problem for humans because it's going to have more mold because it's sitting there and it's drying and you can't get rid of all the mold on dried fruit. And things made from aged fruit are going to be problematic. So wine is made from aged fermented grapes, which are certainly going to get moldy. Mm. Now, in general, I think grapes are great and grape juice. If you were, if you and I were on a tribe, I would be very fortunate to be in your tribe because <laughs> I'm pretty sure we'd be good <laughs> from uh, warring tribes trying to compete with us. But if you and I were in a tribe and we were out hunting, we say, hey, there's some grapes over there. Let's eat them. We're going to eat them really quickly. Maybe if we would squish them, we would make juice and drink it right away. Grape juice is fine but you don't want aged grapes because they're moldy, and then you get the alcohol. Now, this is not to say that humans have never dabbled with alcohol. I think it's something that is uniquely a weakness for us, and we know that tribes across the world drink alcohol, but let's be clear, ethanol is poisonous. Your body has to detoxify this molecule. Ethanol, the molecule ethanol, is not a vitamin for humans. We don't need it in any way. It's a toxin. So you're drinking a toxin, and it's okay. I mean, humans are allowed to enjoy their life. That's why we do what we do. We, I want to eat an animal-based diet. I think you enjoy eating an animal-based diet yes. most of the time because you want to feel good, but you want to feel good to enjoy your life. And one of the ways that we enjoy our life is with food and drink. So alcohol, I'm not judging alcohol. I just want people to understand wine is not good for you because of the mold toxins and the alcohol. It may be an enjoyable thing, and that's fine. Balance it in your own life. Yeah. I, I, I know a lot of people that, that, that are telling me that, oh, when I'm drunk, I sleep better, which <laughs> is, they might fall asleep better, but like you're, you just mentioned, their sleep is damaged. Definitely. This is unequivocal. There are so many studies about this in the medical literature. If we put EEGs, if we put an electroencephalograph uh, on someone's head, we can track their sleep architecture very carefully, or you can use other devices that are less precise, but we can see that the, the transitions into deep sleep, the transitions into REM, they're all disordered wow. when someone, yeah, is, is drinking alcohol. It's not a good thing. I want to cook my meal. Should I choose butter or margarine? Definitely, you have to go with butter. Margarine is a nightmare. Okay. Just like so many things, margarine is probably one of the biggest... Ah, this is one of the biggest scams ever put over on humans. Uh, margarine is hydrogenated vegetable oil. So vegetable oils, also known as seed oils, are a big problem for humans in my belief. Very strong belief that these are not something we would have ever consumed. Certainly we would have consumed occasional seeds as humans, but I don't think we ever had that many seeds and that mm -hmm. seeds were essentially survival food for humans. We're only going to eat seeds evolutionarily as humans when you can't get something better, when you can't get an animal and you can't get liver and heart and all the organs and the muscle meat from the animal. 
But if you're starving and you can find a few seeds, that's a backup food or a fallback food for humans. But if you think about it, even if you're eating seeds, you're never gonna get the quantities of oil found in seed oils, which is made from pressed, processed seeds. We concentrate the oil. And there's a compound in seed oil called linoleic acid, which is an 18 carbon polyunsaturated fatty acid. It's a, that's a mouthful. It's an omega-6, 18 carbon polyunsaturated fatty acid. And that fatty acid specifically has a lot of detrimental side effects associated with it. And there are detrimental side effects associated with the oxidation products of linoleic acid. The take home message is really that seed oils are a big, big problem for humans. We know that organs are the most nutritious food we can get. What is the best way to eat them? I think that for most people, the best way to eat organs is gonna be raw. Yeah. It preserves all the nutrients. Okay, you, but you're a soldier, you <laughs> eat it raw. I am not, you know, and most people are even worse than me. I mean, the danger to lose the nutrient nutriment is to overcook it, right? Right, right. Cooking is okay, um, but you're right. The more you cook an organ, the more of the nutrients you're going to lose. Our, our food supplement are organs that are not overcook because it's, I would like to, you to talk about the process that we made it. Yeah, the freeze drying process. So this is really interesting to me that I, when I think of, of making a supplement out of an organ, most people probably think of dehydrating, but dehydration happens at 140 degrees. When, when we make these supplements like Warrior that we're making with you and, and the other desiccated supplements from hardened soil, they're freeze dried. Essentially what you can do, this is fascinating chemistry, is that if you take enough pressure away, if you put an organ into a very low pressure environment, you can dehydrate that organ. You can take water out of that organ at a freezing temperature, mm -hmm. at a freezing point. So you can essentially dehydrate an organ at the point at which it's frozen. So you can dehydrate an organ in the freezer of your refrigerator, essentially, preserving as many nutrients as possible. I think fresh, raw organs are the best, yeah. but the next best thing, in my opinion, is desiccation or freeze drying. And that's amazing, because then you can chop up the organ after you desiccate it, and we don't add anything to it. There's no fillers, there's no flow agents, there's nothing else in these capsules. And you can chop up the organ, and then you can put it in a capsule. It's like space food, right? This is what the astronauts eat, is, is this freeze dried food. So we're using this incredible technology to make the organ really palatable, so that if you don't want to eat desiccated heart, yeah. if you don't, excuse me. Or so, raw, raw heart, yeah, so, raw liver, raw testicle. So if you don't want to eat raw, you can get it in the, tap, in the capsule, which is so beneficial. And you know, when I, was, when I was starting this company, Heart and Soil, I thought about my family and I thought, who do I want to get organs? My sister, my niece, my nephew, my mom, and my dad. They're probably never going to eat raw organs, George. I'm still working on them, but they will do the capsules. I, I, I'm lucky I had the chance to travel around the world and I went to, to Africa and Kenya and I met the, an hunter-gatherer tribe called the Maasai. And I remember they told me that when they kill a, an animal and they're about to eat, eat, eat it, the first thing they go for, it's the organ. And us in our Western culture, we don't do that. We eat the filet mignon and, and you know, they, they sometimes when they have too much meat, they give the filet mignon to the dog. That's what I thought it was incredible. They're, they're the best. And you and I were talking about the examples of this in the natural kingdom as well, whether it's a lion or a hyena or an orca. Orca killing a great white. Right, and eating the testicle and the liver and the organs first. We know now, looking at nutritional science, that there are unique nutrients in the organs. Yes. But when you and I go to a grocery store and you see the meat counter, there's almost never any organs. Never. Occasionally there's liver. I think it's our duty to inform the, the audience about the importance of eating organs. And that's why most people, sometimes they, they, they complain because they cannot eat raw organs. And I don't blame them, I'm a little bit the same. I like to cook it. But if you still have a hard time eating it cook, you can have the, the food supplement so you, you, you can optimize uh, your, uh, your uh, amount of uh, nutrition. Exactly, that's what's so beneficial about them. If you can't get the organs, I mean, a lot of places people travel, they're not even gonna be able to buy heart or liver anywhere or any of the other organs. You certainly can't go to Whole Foods and get spleen or kidney or testicle. And so the desiccated organs are so good just to fill in those gaps for people and really help them uh, understand how it feels. And the coolest thing, I, I think is seeing the way that people respond to this. 
with Hardened Soil, you know, we've been in business for a couple of years now, and the, the response we hear from people is incredible. Like, people have life-changing experiences when they, a lot of times when they just add desiccated organs to their life. And what's so cool about this for me is I never want them to stop there. If that's where they stop and they get benefit, that's great. But I really want that to be the spark that gets them interested in, in eating better quality meat and maybe trying fresh organs. And then maybe cutting out some of the processed food and the seed oils and the processed sugars and just falling down the rabbit hole and getting more and more animal-based. And that's what we see over and over. And it's so satisfying to see people feel so good. You did an animal-based diet for a month. I did for a month and um... I gotta admit that if I would need to physically perform again, that's what I'm, I'm, I would go for, 100%. I felt I had less, much less inflammation. I, uh, I recuperate very well. And one thing is, every time I was finishing eating, I didn't have that, that drop of energy that I normally had after eating, uh, let's say, uh, a, me a meal with a lot of sugar or, you know what I mean? I, I think it's, it's important uh, because most people, to them, eating an animal-based diet could sound preposterous. Uh, when I first heard about it, I, it sounds crazy, <laughs> but I'm the type of person that I never I was never afraid to try something different, to think outside of the box. And, and when I try it, I, it really changed my mind. It really opened my eyes to uh, a, a different thing. So I invite people to try it. You know, give it a try if you if you wanna if you wanna see what it what it feels like, and they might change their their mind after it. Eat animal based diet, meat, uh, organs, and if they cannot cook their organs or eat eat them raw, take the supplement. Yeah. And uh, yeah, go, go from there. Fruit is good too. Like uh, the good sugar. Me, I'm an athlete. I need sugar because I'm training a lot. So uh, I was uh, very happy when you told me that I was, <laughs> I was allowed to eat uh, the fruit to get my sugar. When we started working together, I think that you, you came to me and said, or I reached out to you and, and I couldn't believe that you responded. I was so honored. I was like, oh wow, this is amazing. And you said, hey, I wanna try the carnivore diet. And I said, let's do animal based. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. I said, don't do, I, I think eating meat and organs will be great, but let's add some fruit to it. Mm -hmm. And people hear fruit and they think, oh, sugar, sugar's not good for me. But it's so important for everyone to realize that- They don't, re they don't they're mistaken. Exactly, it's not the same. Sugar in fruit performs totally differently in the human body than sugar that is isolated and stripped out of what we might call the food matrix. It sounds crazy, but there's so many studies in the medical literature with fruit, whole fruit, showing that it's beneficial for blood vessels, for even for insulin sensitivity. Honey improves insulin sensitivity in humans, which is crazy to think about. We think honey is full of sugar. Mm -hmm. Sugar is bad for diabetics, but honey actually improves insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance is at the root of diabetes. I, I'm under the impression that in the next few years, people will open their eyes and, and start to educate their, themselves into nutrition and they will find the truth about what works the best. And I invite them to, to give it a try. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, the best way to do it is to give it a try. For sure, you ask your doctor first if you have a condition, but give it a try. You know what I mean? You'll see for yourself what, what's the best. For me, the best was going on an animal-based diet, prioritizing meat and organ first, then having my fruit. So I'm sure I have the sugar that I can train and, and have a very active lifestyle, and I loved it. I think it's important for people to seek truth. That's one of the things I talk about a lot is being a truth seeker. And ultimately, sometimes people ask me, why should we take your, why should we take your advice on this, Paul? And I say, don't take my advice, try it. That's right. Think for yourself, try it, you know? And, and this is an idea that I want people to understand. The other thing that I'll tell people is if you're thriving already, don't change a thing about your diet. But I think the majority of people listening to this are have some aspect of their diet, whether it's body composition or sleep or libido or mental clarity or mental focus or athletic performance that they want to improve on. Yeah. And a lot of people, I think, we've been told the way to get better is to eat more plants and more vegetables and maybe even to eat vegetable oils. We, we had the chance to travel the world and to see to see it with our, with our own eyes. And it, but it's hard to make people to understand this if they have not wit witnesses themselves. You know. Yeah, yeah, and that's hopefully that's part of the value that we can bring is to tell the stories and. That's right. So, and, and so I, I guess the best way to live a long life, happy, and be healthy 
in terms of nutrition is to try to replicate what our hunter gatherer ancestor were doing. I couldn't agree more. And so that's why I think the study of this is so important. And then trying to, at least, you know, I try to triangulate that with modern science and I frame it all that way in the way I'm thinking about it. And it's so interesting because, you know, science is so challenging. There's a study for everything. And the, the, the nuances of the studies are so complicated that it, for me, it wasn't until I actually framed all of this in the perspective of some sort of evolutionary context and thought about where we've come from as humans that things began to make sense because you can, you can get so easily confused by observational studies, epidemiology studies, which are not a real experiment. They're just a food survey of people that associates red meat with, with problems. And then when you look at the study, you say, wait a minute, the people who are eating red meat are also doing other unhealthy behaviors. They're smoking, they're drinking, they're riding motorcycles, they don't exercise, they're not in the sun. And these studies that are being talked to by the, about the public, these studies that are being talked to, these studies that are being described to the public never make that distinction and they can't distinguish between is it the meat these people are eating or is it all their other unhealthy behaviors that are bad for them? And then you can look at observational studies done in other parts of the world like China or Asia or Taiwan or Thailand or any of these places and you find that in the eastern countries, people who eat the most red meat have the best health outcomes okay. because in those countries, the people who eat the most red meat, are that's associated with affluence and prestige and so they're doing good behaviors. So people should be very careful about being misled by observational epidemiology. We've been misled so much on all of these issues, both on meat and on plants, in my opinion. And, and one thing that is kind of funny to me is that when you go buy organs at the, at the but butcher store, it's, it's, it's cheap, you know what I mean? Nobody and it's the them. most uh, nutritious food you can get. It's cheaper than everything, you know, almost. And, yeah. uh, I mean, it's just that we don't, we stop eating it. We have it all backwards. Yes. We just need to turn everything, you know, on its head and reverse it, which is what we're trying to do. And That's right. I think it's going to result in a lot of people doing so much better. So thank you so much for all of your work with us, brother. No, man. I'm, it's an honor. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited and uh, I'm, I'm happy and glad to be part of that journey to try to educate people on uh, the best way to uh, optimize their, their lifestyle. It's know? so exciting. And I mean, I can't think of a I honestly cannot think of a, of a better person to do it. You know, your life is so incredible. I'm so impressed by your philosophy and the way that you lived your life as a martial artist. So, yeah. you know, really so grateful that we can do this together. It's incredible. Oh, thank you. The, the, the pleasure is mine. And <clears throat> let's not forget that health is the most precious gift that you have. So uh, don't waste it. Yeah, it's so incredible. I never thought that I'd be sitting here with George St. Pierre. <laughs> Life is crazy, brother. Life is crazy. Life is crazy. <laughs>